All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning back in. Nick, what do we have for everybody in this one? A little bit of a year in review. So we take a clip from each of our first eight episodes and we kind of just took a little bit of what we really enjoyed, uh, some of our favorite takeaways. Um, and we also throw in a little snippet of our ninth episode, which is with a nutrition uh, science expert. So yeah, stay tuned for that at the end. And um, we also just want to say thanks for everything this year, all the support, all the listeners. Um, we've really enjoyed this and we really look forward to what's coming next. Yeah. So thanks. And we look forward to connecting more with everybody in 2021. Yeah. Cheers. Hope everybody has a good year. I uh, would, I, I, you know, and I, I might give this particular piece of advice to anybody in, in almost any, uh, certainly in any of the health healthcare mm-hmm. or health science fields is think about what you want your contribution to be. Think about why you want to do this, of course, mm-hmm. but think about what it is you want to be able to affect by taking this route. The answer can change and evolve over time. You don't have to commit to something for your life, but have in purpose in mind. Because, you know, if there's one thing that is unimpressive to me when students come to our program to interview, you say, tell me why you want to do this. You say, and, 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 you know, lots of folks are given, and, and maybe it's anxiety provoking situation. So you're going to go with something safe. Like, well, I want to help people. I've always. That's got to be 90% of answers. I want to help yeah, people. Yeah. Broad I want to, uh, uh, um, uh, I've always enjoyed, uh, or, or everybody in the family tells me their problems. You're like, okay. But that's not a very reflective answer. That doesn't say to me, I have a sense of purpose in this. Because graduate school, especially a program, a doctoral program, let's face it, you're in the middle of it right now. It can be pretty brutal. When you Mm -hmm. think about the demands on your time, what you're expected to do, how to perform academically, your clinical training, your research. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, you know, you're going to have some kind of personal life through all of this too. Is your family ever going to see you? Try your girlfriend ever see you? That kind of thing requires the motivation that comes from your heart. What is the highest goal in our, you know, the, the highest goal in any society should be, um, the education of the man, right? Mm-hmm. The education of the woman, the development of the man, the development of the woman, it, providing for their health, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is just be a basic human right. Yeah. So the, the man, so the woman can fully develop uh, and fully realize uh, their potential, right? Mm-hmm. And realize whatever they, they want to. But yeah. that is not the aim of our society at all, right? I mean, no. the aim of our, I mean, look at who's at the top of, you, you know, literally the, the political system right now. The aim of our society is something entirely different. In fact, the interesting thing about uh, capitalism, right? You know, we say we're, oh, we're a Christian nation, right? Oh, you know, a lot of people running around out there calling themselves Christians right now. Well, last time I checked, um, you know, I, I, I'm positive. I read this somewhere that the that uh, the Bible says that the root of all evil is greed, right? Yet the very economic system that the society is based on rewards only one human impulse, right? It, it doesn't it reward compassion. It doesn't reward kindness. It doesn't re, you know. It doesn't reward anything. You know, I mean, go through the human impulse. The one impulse that it, it rewards. Uh, is the accumulation of capital, is, is the want of accumulating capital, is, is greed. How do you go about beginning to prepare a parent to be, I don't know, to like put all of their preconceived notions aside and just be ready to listen? Because I feel like, like that's where people 
putting their own expectations out onto what this situation is going to be, what they're going to go through, they're going to be wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you start preparing parents for that? And that was my parent strategies training. And so what I did was I called it CPR, consistency, per, uh, 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 predictability and reliability mm. consistency predictability and reliability I called it CPR mm -hmm. because it was an aid to help those parents mm -hmm. because it was about preconceived and expectations mm. expectations you're so excited to have the children you're so excited to have your start your family mm -hmm. grow your family and then you have a child who's had different parents, different structures. So now you're gonna have to help them see your structure and feel that now you're mom and now you're dad, or dad and dad, or mom and mom, Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay? And inevitably I would talk about if a child has been in 10 placements, you're gonna have a number of years, almost 10, before they're really going to feel like this is it. Mm -hmm. And you say 10 years? Yeah. Because there's 10 years of the first 10 years of their life, they were moving constantly. And so it doesn't mean that it's going to be as intense, but what it's going to be that there's still going to be some times, maybe around anniversaries, around the placement, that they're going to start maybe acting out, trying to test not consciously, but kind of testing to see if this is really real. Hmm. There will be times that they will test. And it's not that, and it's like, why wouldn't they? Yeah. Because they've been told that this was forever or this is going to be permanent. And sometimes it hasn't been. And so for that, I tell, I teach the parents, it's like you have to kind of understand it from the child's perspective. If they're not calling you mom, the first day actually that's a strength you know let them is that because in in some way if they were just like jumping right into mom it's probably not genuine right so they're doing it because they feel obligated or to put a like, title on it well they also feel like this is a way to connect mm -hmm. okay i'm supposed to say that right you're gonna yeah. be happy Okay, so right. if I say mom and you say, yeah. and I say dad, you're going to be happy. Mm -hmm. But see, that's a superficial something. Right. And initially, that's like the honeymoon. So the foster mm -hmm. adopt, honeymoon. There's honeymoon periods. Doesn't mean that for all children, but honeymoon period. So I teach that there's honeymoon. So if they're calling you that, but then a few months later, they start acting out. They don't want to call you that. They don't want to say the same things. They don't want to follow the rules. What do you do then? Because part of it is, is that they know that if they keep testing, they're probably going to be sent someplace else. So they'd rather do it first before you do it. So the test is, and again, children are resilient. They're trying to protect themselves from another hurt. There's a little survey done by Sports Illustrated. It, it asked Americans, which was the most important sport history event in U.S. history. Hmm. And it was one event that most Americans identified, overwhelmingly one event. Uh, Disney made a movie about it. It was during the Winter Games. Oh, The Miracle. The Miracle on Ice, yep. right? The Miracle on Ice, where... Our college kids mm -hmm. defeated the, Russian, the Soviets, the Soviet, right? Sorry, yeah. yeah, not wow. everybody thinks it was the championship game. It wasn't. It was a semifinal game. Mm -hmm. They had to go on and beat Finland. But it was a really tough time in the <laughs> United States, right? Mm -hmm. Late 70s, petrol, gas uh, rationing, uh, a real economic downturn. And these young college kids do the unimaginable against the mighty Soviets. It's sort of the late Cold War era. Mm -hmm. They were our big enemy, not just in sport, but in economics and military, right? Mm -hmm. And our college kids beat them. What a moment. It was this patriotic moment that brought us all together. Mm -hmm. this, this, this wave of good feeling, right? Mm-hmm. 
Same thing ha used to happen in antiquity. When your athletic representatives do well, and think about our own colleges teams or our hometown team, if they do well, there's this wave of good feeling mm -hmm. throughout the community. People are filled community. with pride. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. And so, and, and, and that cements the position of the status quo. In this case, in antiquity, the king. Mm -hmm. So he's sending political messages all over the place by competing and winning, perhaps himself or a representative mm -hmm. um, of his administration, we'll say it that way. Um, so sport has been political forever. I wish there was some way to connect people across the country on this. And I know that there are different, I've heard different ideas of people writing their stories about being an athlete and what that movement was like beyond getting professional athletes, college athletes, Olympic athletes across the board. And I think that there, and I, I know that there was a recent show that came out from HBO that talked about Michael Phelps and his movement beyond sport and all these different Olympians. And I can't remember the name of it, but there's a, there, this topic, this is a huge topic because we're such America is so sports driven. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. so sports driven. It's, it's so thick in our culture. You know, even, even back to the gladiators, you know, it, yeah. it's, it's carried for generations. And we idolize these people and look at them as though they're gods. And then when they're not on that pedestal anymore, they just fade. Mm hmm. Big, big fish in a small pond, or even a small fish in a big pond. It, it, whatever it is, and, I, and it it needs a spotlight on it. And it, I wish there was something bigger. I wish there was more acceptance around this because of just the different paths that people go when they are done. And I know that some, I know some that are still like into drugs and haven't mm -hmm. moved beyond that. Some of them have stayed stuck in that 22 year old, and now they're like 40. They're stuck there because there wasn't anything or anyone to have the conversation with. And I, I hope that we can break through that wall at some point. To me, the, the best. Uh leaders if you want to use that word but the best people to work with are the ones who help you become better help you and help everyone around them figure out what's needed to be successful but no ego i i really wish we could get away from ego so i don't like to call out individuals um that said i think that the the people who are who believe in things like surrounding themselves by with people who are smarter than they are, who who ask everyone's opinion, who they work with and say, what do you think? What have I missed? Who invite people to criticize, who are willing to say, um, tell, tell me what's not working. Tell, tell me what you feel like I've got wrong or I, I want you to help me make this better. Um, so I have sort of an idea of a type of person and I've met lots of them. Um, but I'm not going to call out any individual. And so I wrote an article on, the, it was called the, the, lone, uh, the Lone Genius Model of Creative Leadership versus the, uh, uh, the Loving Mother approach. And uh, so, you know, similar to those earlier studies, I found there is, there is you know, both styles uh, work. It's going to be different workplaces. It's probably going to attract different kinds of people. They work for different reasons, you know. But really, I think the lone genius model is, in fact, a model where you have the the top leader is the chief creator, and everybody else is working for them to achieve their vision. Whereas the loving mother is like the leader is not the chief creator. It's the it's the person who creates an environment where people can be creative and a thousand flowers can bloom. And both work. They, they're just different types of uh, models, you know. I mean, if you want to extend that, really, like, uh, 
even though America and France and you know democracies, we've created a model that we think is the best, right? You have an alternative like China, which is a a autocratic regime, and you have to you have to admit that they have, they're pretty successful in terms of in economic terms yeah. with an autocratic approach. So, so anyway, so it's another kind of similar kind of reflection on like yeah questioning a little bit the our. I question my own bias, my own assumptions, and I still like the democratic approach better. But I, but I, but I have to admit that the, the alternative works. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I even just heading into this conversation, I probably would have trended towards saying that I thought that loving mother style was probably the better of the two. Mm -hmm. But I think after listening to you, it really comes down to self awareness. You have to be able to reflect on who you are as a person and the impact you want to have on your organization and what the circumstances in front of you are and you have to know what kind of leader you're being demanded to be by your company i think that's a an interesting take that i hadn't really thought of before yeah and people have different personalities right uh, just naturally yeah and so thinking about like personality traits like yeah. people who are higher in orderliness will fit better under that lone genius, but people who are maybe more, op have more openness or agreeableness, right. some extroversion, yeah. uh, they'll fit much better in that loving mother model. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and, and also in my own reflection on myself, I realized I don't like the hyper competitive, um, hyper masculine sort of environments, but some people love it and thrive in it. Yeah. Uh, like some people wouldn't have found the Morgan Stanley experience uh, horrible they might have been like yeah hell yeah I'm energized by that competition you know? so then uh, you know it's I think it's important also to realize who are you as a person as a personality and what's a culture that fits you uh, why I called my podcast your unconscious is showing instead of like your subconscious is showing is because we have subconscious thoughts and emotions but we also have unconscious body mechanisms where if we're like knocked out we're still breathing our heart is still racing or our heart is still beating like we're still alive and so those are unconscious our immune system is functioning and then we have our subconscious and what happens is that our brain will take certain aspects of things that we know maybe are going to happen on a regular basis and we'll memorize them so that we don't have to have them into in our conscious awareness so we can learn new things or look out for danger and so what happens over time with autopilot, let's say with someone that experiences trauma, is your their body and their mind is going to get used to being out and looking out with a radar for something that's traumatic. And so that's like part of like anxiety disorders, panic disorders, trauma disorders is like we will become triggered by our internal and external environment because subconsciously and unconsciously it's connected to these memories or these sensations of trauma. And if we are happy-go-lucky and we haven't had any trauma that we've experienced in our lives then subconsciously like we think it's all good and we can't really relate to someone that's having a panic attack because you're like I don't understand everything seems fine and it's with the education to be like oh, okay this person's having a panic attack this is probably what's happening in their body this is a few reasons why they may be having that panic attack and here's how their subconscious or unconscious may be interacting right now because I know consciously that everything is fine, but this person's subconscious or unconscious is activated and their conscious is turned off because if they were conscious, then they would be where I am and be like, oh, there's nothing going on. And so that's like an example of how someone that's conscious and doesn't have trauma in their subconscious could be disconnected and misunderstand someone that's not conscious and has trauma in their subconscious. And so our brain wants to protect us, wants to keep us safe. And that's why we're gonna look out for things that make us scared. We're gonna look out for things that could help, that could end our lives because we're surviving beings and we don't want that to happen. And so it's, what does your subconscious look like? What did your parents teach you? What did your culture teach you? What did your trauma teach you? What did your lack of trauma teach you? And then are you your subconscious or, and, and okay, so I'm called the truth doctor. I believe that truth is unadulterated reality. It's all the shit that hasn't been affected, which is not much from the moment that we're born, but you have this true core to who you really are. And it's taking a look 
at your subconscious and seeing what do I really believe? What was, what am I conditioned to believe? And then what do I want to do about it? And so that's kind of what my whole platform is, is like, you're not who you think you are. You're not what you think you are and the world around you and all the people around you are also not who you think they are or what you think is going on. And so it's like dismantling almost the entire cognitive map that we've created through our whole existence. I always say that like the diet should fit into your lifestyle. You shouldn't have to fit your lifestyle into the diet. Like you should be able, the diet that works for you is the diet that you can sustain both at an individual level, but also at like a social level where it's not interfering with other aspects of your life. If you can't sit down and eat with your, if you have kids, like eat a meal with your family, like I have a concern, but if you can't eat like a meal with your family just because you're on this highly restrictive diet. Yes, if you have medical issues and you're on a medical, like medically prescribed diet, you you might have some issues, but there's still ways to get around that where you can still engage in like a normal eating pattern with, with sitting down at a table with your family. Um, that social aspect is so often ignored and it's a huge component in like overall mental health um, and it just plays a large role in, in the food environment.